chord button now. That means that we're, we're focused. <sighs> Students. I think one of the, the things I'd like you guys to leave today with is a set of steps on how you predict what the capacitance of a shape is. And it's been, I mean, you should have it in your notes already, but um, for those of you who, who remember, there is a, a kind of a, a specific thing you have to do in order to get the geometric calculation for the capacitance of a system. And, I, and I'm trying to remind you that although we have a technical definition for capacitance, you know, which is, is very, um, it states very little for you. It tells you that, you know, we define capacitance based on the amount of charge that some system could hold under the conditions of a potential difference. And it was based on if you have just, you know, two chunks of metal sitting someplace in space and you move charges from one to the other, giving one of them a positive charge and one of them a negative charge, then depending on how much potential difference was required to move those charges determines what the capacitance of that system is. Now, that alone is the steps necessary to calculate the capacitance of a system, but that really doesn't tell you what is necessary. And there are basically just four steps necessary in order to compute the capacitance of a system. Uh, the first step is you need to be able to get you need to start with the assumption that it's charged. I'm afraid I never really said that before, even when we were talking about it first semester. But there's this idea that, you know, the system is already charged. There's already been a certain amount of charges moved or the system is isolated in such a way that it has a net charge, which means that in the second step, you need, a, you need to come up with an expression for the electric field in terms of the geometry. Now we have been fortunate enough where all of our examples have been very symmetric in nature. You know, we've looked at parallel plate capacitor, the cylindrical capacitor, and today we're going to take a look at, at spherical capacitors. But we've been fortunate that, they, that we've had these symmetrical situations. That usually means then that we're able to use Gauss's law you know, in, in coming up with what the expression is going to be for the electric field, but you could be required to use Coulomb's law for this, which would mean you'd have a much more difficult prospect. It's not impossible, it just becomes more difficult. Because the next thing you have to do is you need to now, now that you have the electric field, you need to integrate the electric field through the space created by your two pieces of metal. So, and this is to get the electric potential from the electric field. So basically, now you've got to do this calculation I put dr, ds, depending on the kind of arrangement that we have in order to have the electric potential created by the electric field. Which brings us to the fourth step, which is substitute into the expression for capacitance. Now, this is what we did on Friday, I'm sorry, on Thursday, when we were talking about the cylindrical capacitor, and I just kind of blew through this assumption that you guys remembered how to do it from first semester, but you know, that's, that's hard to know whether you guys remembered it or not. 
And with our limitations placed on what can be on the exam this year, your ability to calculate capacitance has probably gone up by a pretty huge factor. Now, generally, there are only three types of capacitors that are discussed in the AP literature, and not because they're, they're special to AP, but there's really only three shapes that can be used to make a capacitor. It's really hard to make them you know, in any other way. Although any two pieces of metal can technically be a capacitor, it should be kind of clear that your goal for your device is to try and increase the strength of the electric field between the two pieces of metal and try to isolate the charges. And there's only a few shapes that are successful in doing that. Now, just to, to, to you know, be, be very frank, there's been lots of different kinds of capacitors throughout the years. Um, the first capacitors were known as Leiden jars and probably named after a guy named Leiden, but they were nothing more than a cup within a cup. That's basically what a Leiden jar was. And you can make one of these at home. It doesn't take very much. Uh, a couple of Dixie cups will do it. Um, or since, you know, you guys are teenagers, probably red solo cups. You probably got a lot of those floating around the old house, but all you have to do to make one of these is to wrap aluminum foil on the outside of one of the cups and then put aluminum foil on the inside of one of the cups. That way the cup itself acts as your separator. And you need a way to touch the metal on the inside of the cup. So just stick a paper clip in there. Now, you've created a capacitor. You've got your substrate that's separating the two pieces of metal, which is the plastic cup. And... It's kind of a, a poor man's taser, really. The only problem is to make this a functional taser, you need to charge it up. And to charge it up, you already need some kind of external potential difference. So although this sounds like a great plan, um, the best you've got laying around your house may be 120 volts AC. That's not very much potential difference. To charge something like this up for it to be effective, you're going to need something more like 100,000 volts. And I mean effective, it's not going to kill you, but it's going to make you regret touching it that's that's for sure if you can charge it up but to put it into perspective i used to leave one of these on my desk when i used to teach in arizona all the time there's a lot of stray electric you know charge around uh, arizona because it was dry we would have i had a couple of devices that could generate about a hundred thousand volts doesn't take much scuffing your feet on the carpet in a cold dry environment you can probably get up to around 30 40 thousand volts so it doesn't take much to get up to around a hundred thousand volts uh, Van de Graaff generators generally is what we use to make a, you know, to do this in a, in a laboratory setting. And a Van de Graaff generator is that, is that big thing with the ball on top, you know, I'm sure you've seen them. That's got, you know, something, a base usually at the bottom and you put your hands here and it makes your hair stand up. The Van de Graaff generators used to be, you know, what every physics teacher would have in their classroom. But in Florida, oh, we never get dry days where we can actually use it. I've got one in my stock room, but it never gets dry enough for us to actually effectively take it out and use it so that we can actually use somebody's hair to stand up. Um, and the reason our hair stands up is because you're charging them. That's what it does. It separates charge. And when you put your hand on it, all the hair be in your hair becomes charged in the same way. So the individual, you know, individual pieces of hair repel so that it looks kind of like um, Jackson's picture right now, you know, with the hair kind of standing up in all directions. But you could use one of these to charge up a Leiden jar or capacitor because it's got a lot of potential difference and access to a lot of charge. So, you know, a Leiden jar is a simple capacitor. Could we use the four steps that we just talked about to calculate the, um, the, the capacitance of a Leiden jar? Well, no, not at all. It doesn't have an appropriate shape that provides a nice uniform electric field. We could probably assume that the... You know, this cross-sectional area of the cups, you know, the surface area, I'm sorry, of the cups and the thickness of the cup would probably contribute to the size of the capacitance. But there's no easy way to actually calculate the capacitance unless we physically measured the charges that we moved because it doesn't have the kind of symmetry that would allow for us to calculate it. On the other hand, we tend to focus on things that we can control a little bit easier, which is why we had things like the parallel plate capacitor. 
which although I don't want to go through the whole process, I do think it's good practice for us to talk about the parallel plate capacitor because it represents the most straightforward calculation for capacitance, and it really is a good exemplification of the four steps to calculate capacitance. And it's a nice reminder of how we do the, uh, the Gauss's law for something like an infinite sheet. So let's take a look at the parallel plate capacitor for a moment. And if we add this with last week's notes, you'll have the parallel plate capacitor and a cylindrical capacitor. And then we're gonna do a spherical capacitor at the end of class today, because the spherical capacitor is interesting in that it can be a single plate capacitor. And we'll talk about that too. So to do the parallel plate capacitor, um, for the a time being, I wanna to talk to you just about a single charged sheet. So that's what we're gonna use Gauss's law for. And Gauss's law suggests that we use a cylinder to try and determine what the electric field is around a single charge sheet. I'm gonna say that the sheet has charge Q and has a surface area of A. My cylinder has a, you know, a top that's got a radius of R and Let's just say it has a total height of 2h, so that the amount of it above and below is h. That okay? All right, so first, let's start with uh, recognizing that I'm gonna have a, a charge density of q over a around the sheet. And let's go ahead and do step two. Step one was to ensure that we've already taken a look at what the charge of the system is. So we've, we've gotten a look at the charge of the system. So step two is to calculate the electric field. Uh, we can use Gauss's law for this if we assume the sheet is very big compared to the separation distance between the sheets. We're gonna make that assumption, which means I'm gonna be looking for a way of calculating the flux. through my surface, my Gaussian surface is the cylinder. Looking just at the flux for a moment, so again, we're starting step two here. Looking just at the flux for a moment, I'm gonna break this up into three integrals. One for the top, one for the bottom, and one for the sides. And we've done this quite a few times, but it's been a while. I think we can all agree that the electric field is gonna be coming off of the sheet in nice parallel rays in such a way that if this is the top, this is the bottom, and this is the sides, there is no electric flux through the sides. So all I will have is an electric flux through the top and bottom the top's electric flux will be E times pi r squared, and the bottom's electric flux is going to be E times pi r squared. Since the electric field is away from the sheet, the dot product for the flux will be in the same direction, both top and bottom of the sheet. Meaning I have the electric field going this way, and down on the bottom it's going that way. So it pierces the top and bottom as it exits the sheet. Any question about any of that? Because I'm going kind of fast through this because we've seen it before. All right. So that leaves us with 2e pi r squared as our total flux. We're trying to get an expression for the electric field. That's our goal here. So as I move on, we want to plug that back into Gauss's law here. So Q enclosed is going to be epsilon naught times 2e pi r squared. So now you have to deal with our Q enclosed. Our Q enclosed is going to be related to our charge density times the area enclosed. Well, the area enclosed is pi r squared. 
So this will be sigma times pi r squared, which is going to equal 2e epsilon naught pi r squared. Which gives us not a surprise. Cancel out the pi r squareds, and we get that our electric field is going to be sigma over 2 epsilon naught. The electric field is a constant near the surface of a large sheet. Now, if you want, you can write this, you know, as Q over 2 epsilon naught A. And that gets our electric field in terms of the charge, which we know we need to be working towards. Now, this brings us to the closure of calculating this, which is the last step. Sure. Which is not the last, the second to last step, which is find the electric potential. At this point, we need to remember that we don't have one sheet. We actually have two. And although they are very close together, one of them comes from the sheet being positive. The other one comes from the sheet being negative. Yeah. Now, I should draw it in such a way that we can kind of look at it from the side. Only to remind you that if there's a positive sheet and a negative sheet, like so, the electric field inside is going to be greater than um, sigma over 2 epsilon naught because there's two contributions to the electric field. So the positive sheet is going to have its contribution. And let's just make this a little color-coded here. The negative sheet will have its contribution. So inside the, the, the two sheets, say separated by a distance of D, the electric field is going to be two times sigma over two epsilon naught, or two Q over A epsilon naught. I'm sorry, the math got the better of me, the two cancels. So it's just Q over A epsilon naught. Now, our next job is to find the electric potential. This is step three, which requires that we integrate it. This part's relatively easy. We're going to go from one plate to the other, and we're going to go in the direction of the electric field. It doesn't really matter which direction we go. The idea is that this is the amount of work necessary to actually cause the charges to be where they are. So the fact that we could get a negative sign here doesn't really matter. We believe that the direction should be from the area of low potential to high potential to demonstrate that the charges were pushed that way. But again, the negative sign here is just to indicate the change in potential. So we're going to have our Q over A epsilon dot DS integrated from zero to D. which it's not huge here, Q, D over A, epsilon naught. That's the electric potential from one sheet to another in a parallel plate capacitor. Now this is what brings us full circle because our last step has always been now to find the capacitance and we know the capacitance is defined as the charge per unit voltage. We have an expression for the voltage. It's assumed that it's based on the charge, which is why we get A epsilon naught over D. Now, this isn't a surprise, and this process shouldn't be a surprise, but it's a reminder that there are four steps in order to figure out what the electric potential would be. I'm sorry, what the 
capacitance would be for the electric potential created by a charged sheet. Now, the only shape we've not looked at right here, so it wouldn't make any sense, there'd be no capacitance. And similarly, if you look at the cylindrical capacitor, you'll see the same problem. As the outer shell goes to infinity, your capacitance goes to zero. But this year is the one that I'm gonna have to leave you with to consider. And I can't draw like that. I gotta draw the background one first. So this is a, you know, a cylindrical, I'm sorry, not a, a spherical capacitor. And it'd be really hard to make a spherical capacitor. For obviously, you know, the obvious reason is how do you connect the wire to the inside part of the sphere? But there's some good theoretical work here for a spherical capacitor that has maybe inner radius A and outer radius B. And it'd be good practice for you guys to take a look at it. Let's also say that the inner radius is the one that's charged positive and the outer shell is the one that's charged negative. And what I'd like you to do tonight is if the inner one is charged positive Q and the outer one is charged negative Q, I want you to go through and complete all four steps. Yes, you could look it up in your textbook. It's, it's right in there. So you can verify whether you're getting it right or not. But try going through the steps. You know, I've already given you the first one. It's charged Q. So now your job is to use Gauss's law to come up with the electric field between the plates. You already know what that's going to be. It's, cylind it, it's, it's spherical. Then you want to find the electric potential. You already kind of know what that should look like. This should be a fairly straightforward activity. It shouldn't take you but a couple of minutes. But here's what I would like you to do after you've done that, is consider the limit of your answer as B goes to infinity. Consider the step five. Consider what happens if you took the outer plate and extended it to infinity. For everything else, we would have gotten no capacitance. Like if D went to infinity, C goes to zero, right? That's what, um, that doesn't happen here, which makes for a, a the fact that there, this doesn't happen here, which means that in this particular circumstance, we get a residual capacitance for the inside shell of a charged object, which actually has some pretty weird stuff going on with it. It means the earth is a capacitor and a single shell spherical capacitor. It's charged up from the rays of the sun and the fact that it moves through the solar wind, which means the earth discharges this energy as well. So we're gonna pick this up right here tomorrow. We're about five minutes from the end of this discussion. So, and I have less than a minute before it's gonna dump us out. You know what, you could, oh, sorry. Oh, I lost.